to kick us off, it would be good to, uh, to hear who's here today, who is on the panel, why we should listen to, of course we're always going to listen to, but I think most importantly, I'm really keen to paint a picture of your experience and very deliberately with the panel, you would have seen this in the, the event page and the marketing, very diverse in terms of backgrounds and the thing a lot of you will know is this is our first Data Grind event for quite some time and we wanted to come back and, and meet the moods, you know, we didn't want to come back and say everything's amazing, you know, like there's no problems, the world is great, everything's awesome because it's, it's not, right? But what we're really trying to do here is say, look, 2024 is probably going to be tough. You know, you're going to face lots of hardships, you're going to have lots of failures, probably, we all will, but how you can be more resilient and how you can strategize and work around it. So, sorry, that was very loud. Who wants to go first? Amy Kelly, you ready? Sure. Yeah? So who are you and what's your expertise and what's your background? Hi everyone, nice to see you all. Um, my name's Amy Kelly. I am a B2B marketing consultant. I'm also on the board of directors of Creative Edinburgh. And I am happy to say that I work with Deck and Nick and the rest of the team on Startup Green Scotland. Um, I think I recognize a couple of people from some of my workshops that I run every so often. Um, so yeah, I mean, my background, very much B2B marketing, been in uh, marketing for I think my whole career really. <laughs> And I've worked for big, massive tech companies like Google and Facebook back when it was Facebook, so I'm just going to call it Facebook. Um, and different PR agencies and, and companies down in London, uh, from state sustainability to PR and communications. And then I moved up to Scotland. Uh, well, like obviously I'm from Scotland, but I moved back up to Scotland um, in July 2019 to head up the marketing and open the EMEA office for user testing. So some folk might know of user testing. They're a vast Silicon Valley uh, company that's went during our, I think there was only six or seven of us when we opened the company here. Um, Andy, the CEO, had done his master's in Edinburgh, so really wanted to bring San Francisco to Edinburgh. And... Uh, I was very lucky to obviously get the director of a media marketing role to really kickstart the marketing from scratch. Tiny team, we scaled massively over the three years that I was there. Um, you know, 800% growth, massively, like hired across Europe, grew the customer base. It was definitely my biggest experience of scrappy marketing at the start, scaling up uh, during my time we IPO'd there and sold and, and then... Um, and now the, the two biggest competitors, user testing, user zoom, have come together. So there's been so many things that have been happening, you know, over the past few years. It's really interesting, to kind of just keep abreast of their story as they continue. But for the last year and a bit, I've been um, working independently as a consultant. So I work with clients all over Europe, helping them implement customer-first, revenue-focused marketing strategies. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Amy. Tough one to follow. What about you, Rob? Who are you? Yeah, I won't try and follow it in terms of. <laughs> Um, my name is Rob. Uh, I've uh, run a few companies and, and started a few companies, mostly in the zero to one uh, stage. So uh, have raised uh, investment uh, and bootstrapped uh, both uh, angel money and VC money, both here and in the US. Um, I've also helped other companies uh, with their kind of funding rounds. So uh, the types of kind of questions, I guess, that I'll be uh, talking through uh, is specifically around the funding landscape. It would be really helpful. It seemed like a lot of you are founders. How many are, are actually doing, uh, want to do bootstrap or, or you're focused on bootstrap and you're not uh, looking for investment? Okay. And then uh, how many people are considering investment or a and actively like I'm raising right now? Give me money. Okay, cool. Um, so, so yeah, uh, happy to kind of um, try and demystify a little bit uh, of that process. Uh, I also run Campfire, uh, which is a uh, weekly newsletter targeted at Scottish founders. So you should all be subscribed to that newsletter. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of sector, if it's relevant, uh, I've done everything from consumer social to B2B SaaS and now in um, uh, gaming and LLMs. So really all over the place. Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. Amy Wallace, last but not least, Sydney. I have to follow both a great Amy and I know. Amy. Just it's hard. No pressure. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. Um, I work as a leadership coach, facilitator, and consultant. I work with startups and scale ups to help them navigate the world of growth and scaling and everything that comes with that. My background is in tech as well. I worked at Slack for eight years um, and a couple of smaller startups before that. So, just like Amy said, um, 
I have experience of of that roller coaster of going from a smaller company. So Slack was about 50 when I joined to um, 3,000 when I left and we've been acquired by Salesforce, joined the 70,000 person org. So I now take what I learned, um, the mistakes I made, uh, and then combine that with the coaching, which I've been doing since 2017 um, to help founders and teams navigate the really tough decisions and um, work they have to do. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Panelis. And thank you again for your time, Mike. I know how much you all have on. It's unbelievable. I'm sure your calendars are totally full. So, so thank you again. <laughs> so where should we start? And actually, I'm going to cheat a bit by asking the audience and using Slido. We do love a bit of tech, like I said. So what we got? Lots of funding. So it could be a nice natural one, Rob, potentially. What else have we got? How to engage with the ecosystem. I love that question. Grant funding tips, okay. Specifically, physical health. I like that actually. Often forgotten. How to meet people that haven't caught walkitis. Um, might come to that potentially if we have time. Um, interesting one, slightly different angle. So I think if we go with the middle, most asked one, Rob. And this obviously comes back to your introduction. Um, so you're somebody who, of course, is raised on multiple occasions. So say. Um, so you obviously have a good feel for. What investors are looking for, and I know we've done quite a few sessions recently with a couple of groups of founders, and this is going to be like a, a five-parter question, so hope you can accept that. <laughs> I'll turn it into a Maybe not five, question. but there's going to be a lot in it. So I'm at, as I've been to a couple of the, the audience just before as well, and I think there's a lot around that initial investor outreach, which is maybe interesting. Um, so how do, you, how do you break through the noise? Because obviously in, in trade trade for at the moment, there's not an abundance of options in, in, in Scotland or certainly um, is on a downward trend globally at the minute as well. So why don't we start there, Rob? How do you suggest founders break through the noise in, and get through to investors and get responses? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be really difficult and, and say, uh, like, first off, understand, like, why is it that you actually want to raise in the first place? Like, if you are using the idea of fundraising as a, as a stand-in for your company performance, because you feel like you have to show progress in something, that's not a reason to go and fundraise. Uh, a far more st strong position would be to get out there, get customers, get users, even if the the, the product is crap, right? Or, 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 or whatever leading indicators that you can get that is bowling you over with confidence. Um, the more that you do that, the easier it will be when it does come time to, um, to fundraise, if that is for you, I think understanding what it means to like what track you're on and the different types of investors that are out there, I think is also really important. If you think you want to build a profitable business, maybe you need a little bit of cash to get going, and then after that you'll become profitable. Uh, thinking that you're going to need nor or should even go for like power venture VC is not the case. So understanding like what kind of funding journey you want. I think a lot of uh, founders early on think, I have this great idea, I've drawn it on a napkin, please give me money, and you know, I'll go build the thing. Like, I, I don't understand, like, why isn't anybody doing that? And, and it's because that doesn't happen, uh, or, or it shouldn't happen, right? And I think that a lot of people assume that we're in a, you know, she said a downward trend. Um, people are still writing checks, people are still investing, uh, it's just that the onslaught of easy money has dried up a little bit because of a number of reasons. Part of it is the economy, but part of it is also, uh, frankly, investors are followers. And they have, you know, be because um, a, a certain cohort are nervous uh, or maybe think that the market is now oversaturated or, or that, that, that uh, the rounds were too large, people are just pulling back and just being a little bit more conservative. This happens all the time. Uh, and so I think that just blaming the market situation for your inability to raise is not necessarily a, a valid kind of excuse. Um, I also take issue with the, well, uh, the funding landscape here in Scotland. If you are building a company that you think requires or needs funding, why are you just looking in Scotland? I, I do meet a lot of people who are like, yeah, I've, I've gotten like five angel syndicates on my list and none of them are re re you know, responding to me. It's like, you only have five? Oh yeah, there's... I mean, there's only five in town, right? Like, no. There's London. There's the rest of the UK. There's Europe. There's the US. Like, why are you just, 
you know, uh, focused on, on, on the kind of local scene. You know, you're not building a, a Scottish company, you're building a company. So you should be thinking of yourself, you know, in, 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 a, in a wider context. In, in terms of a practical thing, just because I, I feel like I've just been yelling, um, uh, even though I might sound like I uh, uh, come from Silicon Valley or, or any other thing like that, I, I, I didn't actually have a network uh, out there at all. Uh, I came from the wrong coast. Uh, I came from the wrong background. I didn't have any any familial ins, and I actually used cold outreach as a as a as, as a as a tool. Cold outreach can definitely work if you're if you're talking about the order of like preference. Uh, an introduction from a fellow founder is top. I think cold outreach is second, and I think an introduction from an investor is third, personally. People can debate that, but um, if you get int introduced by an investor, there's a chance that someone might say, well, why, are you, why aren't you investing in them, right? Um, that's a generalization. Uh, but uh, being, uh, being um, introed by another founder, how can you make that happen? Look up and see who the uh, investor has invested in and who might be relevant to your stage and, and, and to your scale. Reach out to that founder, ask them, Hey, what do you think about this investor? Are they are they good to work with? I'd love to kind of get on for 15 minutes and just chat about your experience with them. And through that process, you know, maybe ask for an intro or or if if the relationship is right. But cold outreach is to like, totally works. I think you'd be surprised at how crappy the 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 messages that 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 VCs and investors actually get. Um, actually, being able to look at your your cold message and know what it is that you're building. You might think it's clear, but it's usually not clear. Uh, I don't want a 10-page you know, uh, uh, diatribe. You should be able to describe what you're doing in like two to three sentences, maybe three bullet points max, uh, with a very, very simple call to action. Um, and um, so, so, so don't, don't dissuade. I can go into a bit more tactics later if that's, that's helpful, but I feel like you've heard my voice long enough. No, that's very right. That's exactly what I wanted, so, so thank you so much. I think fundraising is actually Maybe a good segue into a question I had for Amy Wallace, which is on resilience. And I mean, this comes back to the introduction at the start, which is building a startup's hard. Right? Let's, let's be honest, it's, it's hard. You know, there's, there's no avoiding that. Um, fundraising certainly is a challenge. I mean, that's something that we, we hear quite often with lots of founders in the community. Selling is hard, building a team's hard, building a product's hard. Life's just hard, right? So. Amy, I'm really keen to get your perspective because I, I suppose in, I guess to Rob's point, we don't want to get too much into the narrative of, you know, doomsaying and 2024 is going to be a car crash and everything. But obviously things are hard at the best of times. Is there any advice, Amy, at the moment that you're sharing with people for this year specifically in terms of resilience and how to, uh, how to cope and, and thrive as best as possible? So I don't know if this is specifically for this year, but what I will say is that the fundamentals are incredibly important. They're also really difficult to do well. By that, I mean run, starting a startup, incredibly difficult. Scaling a startup, incredibly difficult. Joining a growing startup, incredibly difficult. It doesn't get easier. It just gets more complex. I don't know if it gets more difficult. It, it, some might argue it's different. It's certainly different. But it, it's hard all the way. And it's uh, as you grow, increasing complexity comes along. And I think the reason that smaller startups sometimes feel easier or more fun is that you have a group of people, usually a smaller group of people who know each other very well and they have all these shortcuts in the way that they talk and communicate. And they're quite naturally on the same page because they've come together, they've, they feel the same way about things. As soon as you start introducing new team members, they don't have all the context, they don't have all the background, they're bringing a new perspective, which is what you want because that will help you thrive. Um, but then you're still using the same shortcuts you're still using the same, uh, the same language, you're still using the same tools, the same techniques, and that's where things can fall down. So coming back to that idea of the fundamentals, I mean things like clear communication. And those two words are incredibly difficult to actually achieve. If you have a conversation between two people who know each other really well, that's one thing. Bring another person into that, that adds complexity. Um, being able to give and receive good feedback, and by good, I don't necessarily mean positive, but I mean actionable feedback to people is incredibly difficult. That is a key skill for anyone who wants to grow as a leader. Um, and that, that skill gets more difficult as you grow. So giving feedback to a team of five is 
significantly easier, to be honest, than giving feedback to a team of 10. Being clear in your communication to a team of five, again, much easier or simpler than a team of 10 because you don't have that same complexity. So you need to bring more people in you're starting to think about how do I communicate my message differently? I have to repeat myself eight times. Doesn't necessarily mean people aren't listening. They're all focusing on their job, which is not to do your job. So it comes back to fundamental skills around yeah, communication, um, being able to give and receive feedback, being able to iterate on those skills as things get harder, and then as human beings, being able to reflect on your own emotional reaction to situations. I know that the idea of emotional reactions are not that often talked about. You know, we talk about emotional intelligence, things like that. We think about startups being product roadmap driven, st strategy, funding, things like that. It will absolutely elicit emotional reactions from everybody involved, whether or not they realize it. So there are a lot of founders who will be reacting emotionally to things without being fully aware that they are having that emotional reaction. So I would say in terms of resilience, the key thing would be to build a self-reflection practice, as simple as it sounds. If you can end every week by saying to yourself, I'm gonna sit down five, 10 minutes and answer the questions, even just what went well this week, what could have gone better, and what do I wanna do differently next week, standard retro, like questions, nothing complex there, you will find yourself learning and reflecting significantly more quickly. And I think that is where you build resilience because as you build a startup, you're gonna fail over and over and over again. You're gonna succeed and sometimes you're gonna succeed from what you thought was gonna be a failure. And sometimes the thing that you think was gonna be a success would be a failure. So there are no easy answers, it's about reflecting, understanding, and iterating as you go. And I think that's the definition of, of resilience in a startup. Thank you, thanks so much for that. I know there's something we spoke about before today, and those fundamentals, and it's a nice segue into marketing. Can you hear me, Kelly? Because I know we spoke again about how much is happening in terms of tech and AI. Um, I know, hate to mention it. I'm really keen to hear your perspective a similar question, or a similar answer, sorry, I guess, to, to what Amy Wallace just said around fundamentals. So what does that mean to you in terms of marketing? Um, and what sort of advice are you giving to people on, the, on that side? Yeah, I think that generally speaking then, I think that my advice would be to stop looking at marketing as a checklist. You know, just like, I've got to get that blog, I've got to get that website thing, I've got to get that webinar out. And holistically, just pull it out of the weeds and look at it from like I like to say it's a like common sense sometimes of like person to person like what do these people want to see and what is actually valuable you know the amount of people that say like oh I've just got to keep my monthly newsletter going I'm like okay but like what's actually in that is it is it actually valuable things we all know that there's m countless things that we sign up to and it just sits in our inbox and we, we don't care and that there's a very few campfire one yep <laughs> that are high value and that you always read because it is valuable. So I think it's looking at it differently. Don't look at it just like a checklist. And if it is coming into this new year, and I think we'll touch on this in a second as well, but like later we're talking about priorities, um, just be really specific about what it is that you want your marketing to do for you. A lot of people are like, oh, I just want leads. But it's like, you know, yeah, in a perfect world, we all get leads, right? But like looking above and beyond that, the big scope of what this can do for you, how this can uplift your brand, how this can uplift your entire profile across your ideal customer profile of like who you're trying to target, you've really got to look at it holistically and don't just think of channels, but just think generally, what does this, what do I want this to achieve in 2024? I might just really need more people to know who I am. And so my priorities and the way that I will go after those people will be different compared to the folk that I'm like, I just need to close all these deals that are already in my pipeline. And I also just need to nurture all these people that I've already got engaged. There's different strategies. And I think it just depends on obviously what you're selling, who you're selling to, where they are, and what's valuable to keep them interested, to be honest. It's a bit of a generalization, I think. <laughs> no, that's perfect, Amy. Thanks so much. It's like what we needed. I'm going to come back to quite a few of those themes, actually, because I think I'm really keen to get into specifics as much as possible. Uh, speaking of which, Rob, I'm keen to come back to you around the international bit you mentioned, because, and I know you guys are going to hate this, but there was a nice question on Slido. 
And the one at the bottom, actually, which I'm going to give a thumbs up so it moves up. If I can do that, I don't think I can. So obviously, Rob, you, you made a really good point there around, I know we could call it maybe Scotland syndrome, where it's quite easy to just look at what we have here locally, which which is understandable. You know, it's it's what we're used to in terms of obviously we'll come to events and then this is just the ecosystem. You know, that, that's who's available in terms of investors. I guess question I have for you, Rob, and we've touched on this on the trips we've been on um, with Forest, it's quite different hat, I suppose, but it's a very long way of asking you what key differences should people look out for if they're trying to raise money either in London or in the US? Because it is quite different, I suppose, in terms of the messaging and, and what the investors want and what they're looking for. So what advice would you give? Uh, so speaking of generalizations, all of the following is going to be generalizations. And I think stereotypes have a way of maybe simplifying the mind, but not necessarily uh, being very effective at the end of the day. So like the stereotype is in the States, uh, valuations are higher and everyone's more brash and everyone's, you know, we'll, you'll walk in and you'll walk out with a check and all this stuff. That totally happens, but they're also normal people. Uh, and you have the range of of uh, people with with different risk profiles, just like you have over here. It very much depends on 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 what you're raising in terms of are you raising angel money, are you raising um, uh, uh, venture money, are you are you talking about pre seed stuff, are you talking about you know uh, post seed uh, Series A and 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 beyond. In general, I think that the 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 common wisdom, which I imagine most people here are early stage founders, so it probably doesn't really uh, uh, apply. The 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 common wisdom is that that Scotland has quite a lot of money. It's just not necessarily simple to get to for specific types of businesses. If you want to start a consumer social uh, network, um, there's not going to be a huge amount of money in Scotland uh, for that. There are locations around the world uh, that are known for to, to, to be hubs, and there are positives and negatives for going to those hubs. You, you want to start a social network, uh, and you want to go to, to uh, Silicon Valley, you will then be one out of thousands of people doing that. Um, you, you, so so it, 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 you have to kind of think about, like, what is it that you're wanting to do you know, in, in, in the first um, instance. Another generalization is uh, if we're talking about differences between Scotland and the rest of the world or, or the rest of the, if we're, if we're talking about tiers, if let's say uh, uh, San Francisco, let's say is on its own tier, uh, and then tier one is like London, um, uh, then like Berlin, and then maybe tier two is like New York and stuff like that, Austin, things. Um, Scotland is maybe like, let's say a tier four, right, in, 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 in that scenario. When you're moving to larger ecosystems, in general, the decks coming out of Scotland are much poorer than others. A uh, combination of just looks uh, doesn't need to be that you have to spend thousands of pounds on it, but the decks that I see coming out of Scotland are not great. Like they just don't look very well put together. Uh, so going on something like pitch.com, getting a template and just putting your stuff in that template will make it look a thousand times better. Um, so it's something, something that basic, uh, not being able to, uh, so a lot of people talk about valuations. I think that's an overdrawn argument that valuations are much lower in Scotland. In some ways, I think it's true, and it's true because of a, a number of reasons. And valuations are a problem if you're wanting to grow a company in a particular way. If you want to be a venture, a power venture company, um, so you want to do like seven rounds, you want to go for unicorn and all this, you know, stuff. Then valuation is very important. And and uh, but if you want to uh, get to profitability very quickly uh, and uh, maybe raise once or twice, the whole valuation argument is not as you know, um, uh, as problematic. So generalizations outside of Scotland, um, people are, are seen to be more polished or they're, they're, they're wanting a little bit more um, polish. Um, I don't necessarily think that's, 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 that's true. One of the generalizations that I think is generally true is in the States. I think there is a, a usually a, a more comfort with scrappier, higher risk potential. So um, it, 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 not just from funding, but like for, with sales, for example, I've seen a lot of Scottish companies struggle to market or to, to sell into large organizations in the UK, but the minute they go to the States, those same larger organizations are happy to, to talk to them. And so there is maybe a cultural, more cultural acceptance of, hey, you're a scrappy dude or dudette that's like trying something weird. Yeah, of course I'll talk to you, I'll give you a chance. And, and for some reason that actually has been borne out like enough times that that I would say that it's a thing, um, but um, but yeah, if if you're just thinking I'm going to a place where someone sees uh, 
10 of these every day versus I'm going to a place where someone sees 150 of these things every day, naturally, the, 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 the level of clarity that you need um, and ability to, to stand out, if you want to call it that, but just be compelling is going to be a lot higher no matter where you are. Thank you. Oh, perfect. I don't know if that answered that question or not. It actually did. I think it answered about five questions, which is marvelous. So very, very efficient. So thank you. I'm going to pick up on something that you said, Rob, actually, for Amy Kelly. I did spot a bit of marketing and sales chats to big companies. So I suppose B2B, to, to put it like that. It's a layup. There we go. I do love a good layup at Startup Grains. So Amy, I know we had many questions prepared. Same for all three of you, obviously. And this is one I was really curious about, because I guess... Building a product is one thing, you know, putting something together, doing an MVP, getting people to try it, feedback, and you know, that's, that's incredibly difficult. But getting someone to pay you money, or even at the very least speak to you and be interested potentially in sales is quite difficult, especially if you're selling into, into companies. I guess maybe just quit show of hands, who here would consider themselves to be B2B? So maybe sell into companies, maybe a few people? Nice, most people. Excellent, good. So, Amy, what's your perspective on this? Like, how does somebody take that first step to, let's say they've got a product, so let's say they're ready to sell, they're ready to get the first revenue in. What sort of advice are you giving to people from a marketing perspective, particularly for, for B2B? To support sales? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I guess it depends on if you have a sales team <laughs> or if you're on your own. You know, all these situations will differ, but... You know, there's, and it will completely depend on what product you're selling. Of course, uh, this advice would be very tailored, sp sp specific to what you're selling. But generally, I'd say that, you know, trying to build that trust and credibility and an urgency for someone to buy your product is absolutely not an easy task at all. And how you're presenting that. I think a lot of the key problems with startup founders is they're so obsessed with the products and it's like their baby that they just talk about the product and the features and all this kind of th stuff and it's not how you want to sell that. You, you want to basically go forth and say, I completely understand that you are facing this problem. This is what the future looks like for that problem. If you buy me now, you'll probably be in a better place with that problem. You know, like how can you match that up to what they're going through? You know, a user testing, we constantly talk about empathy for customers. Like, what are they, you know, you might just be a tiny part in their day of, you know, if you're, they're using your product or whatever it might be. So looking at that holistically to see how can I make this message meaningful to you as my customer in the, in the world that you're in and the challenges you face, not just go on and on about how great I am. So it's really trying to put yourself, and I hate it's so cheesy to say, in the customer's shoes, but really trying to have empathy with the customer and, and think, okay, the best way I can show up to say that I can provide value is by showing that you really understand their world. And I think a lot of people are missing that. You know, people assume that people will love to hear about the product. People assume they just want to know the features, all of those things. Yes, they probably will want to know that eventually, but initially to get on a good playing level with these folk, like you really do have to showcase that you understand their world. And so what kind of positioning have you worked on to establish yourself as important in that world? Um, anyone that was at Turing Fest last summer would have probably seen April Dunford. I always go on about her, get her books. She's fantastic. Like she's absolutely brilliant and how she simplifies for the B2B positioning world. You know, she's fantastic at that. And I just I feel like a lot of those learnings of understanding how to go forth with a message that is meaningful for that customer really can make that impact. And if you are are working with a sales team, you know, how are you enabling sales? What assets do they have? And I think that you know, a lot of people shrug their shoulders or roll their eyes when it, when people talk about brand. But the importance of a really good brand, even if you know that it's not quite right or you're going to change it down the line, but just at least be consistent with it. You know, the amount of people that just have one brand and a website and fling decks over that look a mess, you know, that are just not at all on brand. Try and find some consistency to build that credibility to show up as the awesome product that you are. So, you know, just to kind of prepare well and make sure that you're going in with the right message. Can, can I add one thing? There, there was another question about like how, yes. how do you know if you want to give up? Or is it was something around, how, how do you know if you're, if you're uh, when to give up on an idea? And, and yes. if you're at the point where you are 
more in love with the solution that you've created than with the problem that you're trying to solve, give up. Like that, 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 that's a key reason to, to move on. Because, uh, and if you're finding that the solution that you're, that you're developing uh, is not solving the problem that you see very clearly, and you are no longer interested in saying, well, I'm, then I can dump that and I can focus on something else to solve that problem. If you don't feel like that is your, your, your challenge, uh, a, a challenge for you to go for, that's, that's one reason to move on. Um, because if you are not able to put yourself in the customer's shoes, you know, you are not building a thing, you're solving a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that's a, like, it's a really important thing to keep in mind, especially when thinking about your own mental health and, when you're, and, and, and what is it that you're spending your energy on. You should be spending your energy on something that you, you're in love with, right? Here, here. I love this. <laughs> this so we need me. This is awesome. Um, Amy Wallace, I've just spotted a really nice follow-up question to your answer earlier. So good answers, not good answers, good questions from the audience. And this was on the communication bit, which was how to improve it. I know it's lost within like a million different questions. Just at the top, what would you recommend for that? So if somebody is maybe leading a team or is obviously a part of a team and it's something that has come up, so it might be obviously maybe in person, it might be obviously distributed. And I'm gonna actually ask you two questions in a row, Amy, if you're okay with that. Because um, I do have one I'm reeking to, to ask you. But how do they improve it? So they've asked books, a coach, what's your perspective? Hi, I'm Amy. I'm totally biased. Coaches are fantastic because they help you think <laughs> out, things out loud. But books are helpful. I think the main thing for me is fundamentally that no one's going to get this right off the bat and it will continue to be something that people need to improve. That is something I, I like I was constantly trying to figure out how do I become clearer as a leader, as a manager. It, it's just a never ending piece of work. So I think the first piece of advice I would give is to see it as a conversation. So a lot of the time we think about communication as being, I have this thing to tell you, I am telling you, you now ingest this and I expect you to go away and do the thing that I have told you and understand it. And that doesn't work for a couple of reasons. One is people are very busy. <clears throat> Sorry, they're very busy. They're thinking about all the other stuff that you've given them to take care of. So if you come along and tell them once about this really fantastic, clear task that you have for them, it's not that they're not gonna care, but they have a whole job to do. And this might be part of that. So it's a small piece. So the first problem is if you say it once, it's not necessarily gonna land as being the most important thing amongst the many important things they're doing. The other thing is that we come back to this idea of clear communication being a, a Slack message or an announcement or a thing that is communicated once and people should absorb it. And that's not what it is. If you're building a team or even just trying to communicate clearly with, with VCs or your marketing team, or I would emphasize the idea of a conversation. And that means if you say that something to somebody and maybe it looks like they're not getting it, or even if it looks like they are, you can follow up with questions. You can say, okay, what are, you, what are you taking away from this conversation? And if they can't repeat some version of what you said back to them, they haven't understood what you are telling them or what you want them to hear. Clear communication is not necessarily about saying things clearly. It is about understanding how the person listening to you will hear what you are saying. And that can mean it's different depending on the person you're talking to. So this is where the skill becomes really difficult. So practicing it, I would say, have conversations. Don't see it, this is the same thing with feedback. Don't go into it expecting to be able to deliver a piece of feedback and, and that to be absorbed and someone to go away and do exactly what you want them to do. Think about it as an exchange, a back and forth. If you, if you want to communicate, give that other person the space to ask you questions. Ask them what they're taking away. If they seem a bit unsure, you can go back to them and say, well, what do you need me to say to help you understand this more clearly? So yes, books are great. Thanks for the feedback. If, no one, if, if you haven't read that, that's one of my absolute favorite books. Um, it's about how you receive feedback, but it taught me so much about how you can give feedback clearly. So that would be one book. Brene Brown's Dare to Lead is also fantastic. She talks a lot about the idea of um, painting done. We ask people, um, tell me when you think this is gonna be done. And they'll say, two weeks. And you'll be like, great, two weeks. You come back two weeks later, and they're like, cool, it's done. And you're like, that's not what I asked for. But it's their version of done. 
So how do you get really clear about saying, what does done mean? If you're talking to an engineer and you say, when is this going to be done? They might think, I've written the code. What you, what you mean is, it, you've written the code, it's been QA'd, it's gone onto your, uh, your, your production server and customers can use it. And those two are worlds apart. So it's a long rambling way of saying, approach it as a conversation, not as a one-way edict, and give yourselves the room to, to mess up. People are human. You're going to say something that isn't understood. You're going to say something wrong. So are other people. Give each other the space to, to ask questions and, and grow together. That would be what I would say. Fantastic. Thank you, Amy. It's a good kind of segue into what I was keen to ask you. And I'm going to repurpose an audience question, a bit of recycling slash stewing. And I know this is probably a slightly different angle than what I'm actually going to ask, which is around the company culture piece. Because I think it's fair to say that the first few hires you have are going to be instrumental in terms of determining the culture. Obviously, you're set there as a founder, as a, as a founding team, but ultimately, they don't have a huge impact. And I'm really curious here a bit about your story, Amy, of Slack. I mean, that was eight years, was it? Incredible growth in terms of size of team and, and different experiences. And I had a note around a distributed team as well. So I'm kind of curious. I know that's like six themes in one, but I think hopefully it's a good enough question to get your perspective on. So I guess we've got company culture in the early days, how to maintain that or how that evolves naturally as you grow. And then also within that, because I think we're still grappling with this remote and in-person side of things. I mean, just curious in, from the audience, who here works 100% remote? So never in the office, maybe a few people, okay. Who here is a bit of a mixture? Maybe a couple of days in. Anyone in the office all the time? Who want to see? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's something that's obviously still still comes up. So again, I know that was like three questions, but it's great. what's your thoughts? So the first thing I'll say, and uh, anyone who's uh, heard me talk will probably have heard me say this before, but the first thing I'll say about culture is that just because you're not thinking about culture does not mean that you don't have culture. So you, you hear about people who are like, right, uh, we're at a certain size of a team. Let's start talking about culture. What that means is maybe you're trying to codify it. You're trying to define what you want. What it doesn't mean is that at this point you're starting to have a culture. You already have a culture. In fact, if you're just on your own, you, you are creating a culture. As soon as you bring one person into your team, a culture exists. So... I think we have this idea that of the shiny Silicon Valley startup that has the values and the vision and everything plastered on the walls. Um, we aspire to having the fancy offices that you know people can come in and the values are just painted. We've seen that. That's useless unless those values and that culture are actually embedded in the way people work together because that's what culture is. Culture is the way that the people in your teams and your companies work together. That is what companies are. It's humans working together. And if you don't embed that as part of the responsibility of every person in that company from day one, your culture is not going to develop the way you want it to. Culture will develop, but it will not be what you want. Um, so I think that was one of the things that I was always very impressed with at Slack was obviously the changes were immense but it never felt like we lost the heart of it. Um, and I think there were a couple of reasons for that. One is we very frequently evolved the way that we were introducing new people to our culture. So the onboarding process just changed over and over and over again as we were getting bigger and had to iterate. And in the early days, you know, the, the leadership team went through an exercise of condensing the values into a nice slide deck and everything, and then when people joined the company, we would have onboarding days where existing team members would come along and present about one of the values and what it meant to them and how it showed up in day-to-day -day work. So there's an element of bringing people who exemplified the values that the company cared about to, uh, to, to talk about those things and why they mattered to new people. So there's a sense of like passing the baton on as people join. The other thing that I think was key was a, a, an emphasis consistently from the top down that culture was carried 
by every person in the company. So yes, culture is very much driven and can be ruined by by someone who's in the, the C-suite who is just not doing what they should be doing. But it is important to know that if you join a company, you have influence over the culture because you are influencing those who work around you. So if the culture is crummy, um, you might decide to leave, but you also have a responsibility to show up and say, this is not how I want to communicate with others. I am gonna communicate differently. So I think that was one thing that Slack did really well was emphasizing that, that individual responsibility. And to be clear, I am not saying this, if you are in a, a, a truly toxic environment, it is not an individual's responsibility to change that. But in a general, like healthy, safe environment, every individual contributes to that culture. So my team was distributed. Um, I met my team a handful of times over the eight years that I was at Slack. Um, I had a team member in Australia, I was in the UK, people on the East Coast, the West Coast, um, and that's across time zones. People would onboard completely remotely, couple them during the pandemic. And I think I was always very, very proud about the culture of the team because um, we cared about each other, we cared about doing a good job, and I cared about them as individuals feeling like they had control of the work they were doing, the, um, the environment they were in. And by that, I mean, it was not that they could just say, no, I don't want to do this work because I don't feel like it. I think people sometimes think that, you know, someone saying people want to have um, empowerment. It's like, they're just gonna say no to stuff. That's not what I mean, to be clear. What I mean is I trusted them to go do good work. I trusted them to show up. I trusted them to do things like lead meetings or to go and find out information. I pushed the team and I expected them to, whenever we brought someone new into the team, I trusted the team to onboard that person too. Because it was important for them to hear from me as the, the leader of the team, but it was important for them as team members to know that they owned the experience of that new person coming in. So that's, that's really long and rambling, but it, Culture is, is the people and how they talk to each other, is how they communicate. And also, how they get work done. You can have a fantastic product roadmap that's as shiny as you want, and that can be your great culture of like, we're gonna do great things, and if you're not executing against that shiny roadmap, you don't have a culture of execution. I love that, nice reference back to the fundamentals in a way. So I love that loop back. So I've got half eye on time. Um, Somebody said it's a bit cold, so we might try and get our window closed. Um, I kind of need a, an expert of hands. I mean, there's like a, a windy thing on the wall, for lack of a better technical description. But thank you for letting us know. Always keen for people to be warm, because it's, it's February. Yeah, that's a very good point. Is someone okay to close the door as well? Sorry, I feel very lazy up here. But, uh, thank you, great. So. Half hour in time. Um, I have two more questions for each of you, but these are like quick fire. So these are like, you know, uh, in and out basically. Rob, we're going to come back to you. We've not asked you something for a while. Um, so. Probably a good reason. <laughs> no, quite the opposite. Come on. And um, a lot of you probably recognize this from a podcast, and I've unapologetically just stolen it from a podcast. So hope you'll allow me to do that. So obviously we've had many themes this evening, um, quite deliberately, very keen to make this as wide ranging as possible and lots of potential takeaways, I think hopefully. Um, but I think from a panelist perspective, like if you could only share one message with the audience, so let's say you had like a massive sign behind you that was like, this is basically what I want you to go home with in terms of takeaways, what would that be? Um. From a funding world perspective, <laughs> and maybe from a from a early stage operator perspective, um, I would lean into the fact that it's it's up to you whether or not you're you're in terms of how you show up, uh, whether or not you um, succeed in the work that you are doing. You might not succeed. You might be amazing. Might be doing all the right stuff, and your business might not succeed, just like the other ninety five percent of startups that uh, are in your boat, right? But um, it's not because an investor didn't invest in you that the company didn't work. Uh, it's not because uh, you know, that one client didn't, um, didn't say yes. Um, it, it, unfortunately, uh, 
people downplay the role that luck plays in our lives. And that is not a very comfortable thing to, 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 to sit with. But if you can uh, understand that uh, and be okay with that, then, you know, if we're, if we're turning it into a math equation, it's like, um, you know, opportunity um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and luck. Like what can you, can you increase your ability to have more opportunities? Um, and, um, and can you build, build good stuff? Um, but luck will always play, uh, play a role there. So because of that, I, I would encourage you to then take that responsibility seriously. Um, and I mean, there were some really good, really interesting questions there that, that hinted maybe of other things like that, that wokiness question. That's really interesting in terms of whoever, whoever, whoever asked that, like, and I think that comes back to responsibility, right? If you want to build a company your way, build it your way. But if you then get a rejection from the market because of the way that you're choosing to build your company, that's on you. That's fine. That's okay. There are so many opportunities. There's so many, um, uh, companies out there that are showing ways of building companies in new and interesting ways, whether it's politics side on all sides, sides of the spectrum or different ways of, 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 of making money, of raising money. You know, um, I, I, can, I can tell a story of two companies that, that are in the same space. One's bootstrapped and one is, uh, was a VC funded. Um, and both of them could be called successes. One of them's massively loss uh, making and one of them's profitable. And you could probably guess which one's which. Um, and but would you want a stock in the loss making one or the 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 profit making one? I don't know. So um, so yeah, I guess that convoluted way is understand that there's uh, that there's a lot of luck involved in this. Therefore, take on that responsibility. Try to 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 internalize that. Um, uh, be comfortable with your convictions in terms of be convicted in terms of what it is that you're trying to do, and uh, and then don't sweat when it doesn't work, because it won't work. Uh, something won't work, uh, and, and your assumptions, uh, assumptions will be wrong. So get comfortable with that, and then you'll, you'll be able to iterate a lot faster. Fantastic, thank you, Rob. Keep holding the microphone, actually, because um, just to wrap up with each of you, where can people find you? Online, not in person, obviously. <laughs> um, so obviously. <laughs> I'll give you my find friends, you know. <laughs> Um, but obviously, you know, links, campfire, of course, an obvious one. But yeah, add me on LinkedIn. Uh, always happy to go for, for, for a walk. I, I, my preference is to go for a long walk and grab a coffee and talk your ear off. So happy to do that. Campfire.scott uh, and uh, subscribe to that. And yeah, I think that's, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, we're going to stick campfire.scott in the post event email. So that'll be kind of email squared, I guess. You shouldn't need to because everybody's already subscribed. You're right. Sorry. You're right. What we're talking about. Um, who's next? Amy Kenny. You ready? So, same for you. Two questions, I suppose. One message. So you've got like a massive sign, and you know, and that's it. And then, where can people find you? Grant. Um, okay. So, I think that if I'm trying to convey something at the moment, it's assume nothing. You know, when it comes to the marketing, I actually hate the word marketing. It's for me, it's just like not even what I do. But it's. I would like to think it's the experience that we give our customers. So I actually now like to almost think of it as just the customer experience world, <laughs> but we'll call it marketing. But I, th I think that you have to just throw the rule book at the window sometimes and, and look at everything with a fresh perspective. There's so much changing in the world. You know, people are experimenting with AI galore and marketing and all those kind of things. And the word authentic has been like hugely used over the years of like, how do you show up as authentic as a brand and all those kind of things. And I, I think a lot of those things still stay but I think when it comes to your customer, that's where I say assume nothing and know them inside out. So I think that I was an okay marketer for the majority of my career until I went to user testing and the values of what I learned there, because it was all about customer insight, that's when I felt I became an awesome marketer. So, <laughs> you know, that's where I really learned to obsess over the customer and do things off insight and not off real books. So not off academic. I went to uni and I studied marketing and this is the things that you do. Absolutely nothing. I think it's around being really in the know of your customer, what they enjoy kind of consuming in terms of content, where they go for their resources, what keeps them up at night, and, and just building that relationship. I think it's hard sometimes as a small company 
when you have got so many asks of a customer, such as, you know, buy the product or, you know, like, let's grow the product. But then something that would be so key is, is saying, be part of my marketing journey, be part of this experience and let's build, you know, let's raise your profile as well. And I think that that's, that can happen if you are super close to your customer. So it is really about that. For me, I always just talk about customer focused marketing that is revenue generating because when I completely switched my methodology to be all about what customers told me and how I researched and did all of all of my campaigns were based on insights. And those insights then massively paid off for the company, you know, made the company millions. <laughs> so when it comes down to that, you really want to just understand exactly who you're serving and how best to serve them in a customer experience lens and not just look at it as leads, right? There are people at the end of the day, people don't want to buy from businesses, they want to buy from people. So B2B, P2B, whatever you want to call it, but literally that's the world we're in now. And yeah, AI is going to change a lot. Play about with it, test it, um, but don't like massively integrate it to huge systems until we really figure out what's going on. But I think it's great for creativity and scaling activities. Um, just to mention the AI world, because I think it is worth mentioning. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's it in a nutshell, is be obsessed with your customers as much as possible and you'll do the best marketing that you can. Um, and where to find me? Um, I so I work with clients on a very kind of um, individual basis, and it's usually just four at a time. And so I'm not I'm free in like April May time. But if anyone is interested, you can come come chat to me later or connect to me on LinkedIn. Fantastic, thank you, Amy. A second, Amy, Amy Wallace. Second, Amy. Same for you. So one message, if you only had one. So if you had a big sign behind you, etc. And then where can people find you? Um, so I'm going to give a slight twist on what I said earlier about the fundamentals. Um, I think I will say get curious. Um, so very similar to what Amy just said, we live in a world where it's very easy to make assumptions. Our brain, uh, our brains take shortcuts because we couldn't process the amount of data that we have otherwise. Um, and that can be good sometimes, but it can trip us up other times. So I would say whether you're a founder or a leader or someone who's trying to grow in, in the team that you're in, get curious about things. Uh, get curious about your emotional reactions to things. Uh, we are people, we have emotions. And that means that when something stressful happens at work, we are going to, consciously or not, be putting out something into the world. People are going to react to that and then we will unconsciously react to that. So imagine a world in which you've, you've asked someone to do something they're having a really bad day um, and they say, yeah, I'll get to it. And then you've been having a stressful day as well. So you say, why, why, why are you getting all snappy with me? And then it becomes this ping pong ball machine of like stress and emotions. That happens, that's natural. But I would say get really curious about things. Ask questions about your own reactions to things. Um, if there's a misunderstanding, ask yourself, how am I contributing to this misunderstanding? If you think you've been crystal clear about something, is the other person maliciously not listening to you and not doing something? Or is there just something that's not connecting? Is there context that you have that they don't have? Can you ask them questions? Can you get them to tell you about what they don't understand? So I would say that that idea of getting curious means that you can open up questions. If someone gives you feedback, you can say, okay, that's interesting. Can you tell me more? You don't have to take it personally. You can get curious about it. If you're giving someone feedback, give them the chance to be curious as well. So I would say, yeah, get curious about the fundamentals. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, Amy. and um, yeah, come talk to me afterwards um, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you so much, all three of you. Um, Amy, speaking of not connecting, my slides have just gone off. I'll get them back on. So it's maybe a nice uh, serendipity, maybe. Well, thanks so much. Like I said, you three have got so much going on. I mean, to have all of you available on the same day, I think it's a, a minor miracle. Thank you so much to you, the audience as well. Really enjoyed your questions, really enjoyed your input. Yeah.